are we are here now at week eight. Uh, t this week we're going to be talking about visual analysis and what I call the fine art of blogging. So first some uh, minor business here. Uh, first off, I want to make sure everyone has uh, completed the scholarship essay. Uh, if you have not yet, you still have this week to turn it in for full credit. Uh, go ahead and uh, still turn it in at the link on eCampus. So you can get full credit for that. Okay, We are going to be moving on from that particular assignment now. Second, uh, since this week is the first week of uh, early voting in the state of Texas, uh, we have been asked to do a little bit of a public service announcement with our, our classes uh, in order to encourage a, uh, students voting. So if you are eligible and you are registered to vote, uh, you can start doing so on Tuesday, the 13th of October. Uh, you can do in person. Uh, at uh, early voting locations, uh, wherever you are uh, living, wherever you're located. Okay, I certainly will be doing my own voting soon, so uh, you guys should do yours as well if you uh, are eligible. All right, so let's take a look at visual analysis and blogging. All right, so first off, what is visual analysis? Well, put simply, a visual analysis is similar to any other type of analytical essay. So you're making claims and you're finding support for those claims. In this case, however, the subject you're going to be analyzing is a multimedia presentation. Okay, You're actually going to be analyzing something that is visual in nature. And let me be clear here, we don't want to be surface level on this. We don't want you just tell, giving a recap of what's going on in the visual. Okay, You need to find some interpretation of what's going on in that visual. Your ultimate goal in visual analysis is to understand your subject as best as possible and offer that analysis for your audience. While both you and the audience are exposed to the visual element at once. Okay, So you're going to be trying to encourage your audience to see the visual the way you do and to interpret what's going on the way you do. Now the visual can be puzzling in nature or it can be fairly straightforward. Some people do this with art interpretation, uh, art analysis, especially with things such as modern art or surrealist art, okay? Those are definitely uh, subject to interpretation. Uh, m much of it is because, uh, I've, I will admit I'm starting to show off here because I did take an art history class when I was in an undergrad. Uh, a lot of modern uh, surrealist art that you see is partly influenced by dreaming and also partly influenced by uh, trying to deal with the changes of the world after World War I. Okay, there was a lot of cultural shock that took place in that with that war and it was especially hard in the art world because many of the young and upcoming artists wound up being drafted by their nations to fight in that war and many of them didn't come home. Okay, so a lot of talent was lost to the war. Okay, uh, so occasionally it requires additional research for background information. Not always, but if you have to do a little bit to understand what's going on, that's all right. Okay. Now, many times though, it's going to come down to a basic gut reaction as how you are reacting to what you're seeing in that visual, what you're seeing going on. Now, we're going to practice some idea generation uh, for a visual analysis essay. Now, in a minute here, I'm going to be showing you a short film with a number of events that take place within it. Okay? As a means of idea generation, I want you guys to be get, taking your journals out. And what I want you to do is to write about some of what you observe over the course of the film. Okay? Here's some things that you could potentially write about. First off, uh, you could simply write a strict accounting of what the event's taking place. Okay? Just simply, this happens, this happens, this happens, this happens. That's going to be your surface level interpretation. You could uh, write comments on how the events are portrayed. Uh, I will say this uh, clip I'm going to show you is uh, some fairly everyday mundane things that are uh, portrayed in a very unique manner. Okay. Uh, you could have comments on how the effects of the events are, are achieved. 
there is some special effects going on here that's no, nothing too technical it's all practical uh, very much stuff that you would see in like a stage play okay uh, interpretations of any kind of deeper meaning to the visuals is there some sort of interpretation or some lesson that's meant to be derived from this film and then any other noteworthy comments that you would like to make is there anything else that you think uh, is going to be important to know okay so let's go ahead and take a look at the let's take a look at the video clip and once it's done we're going to give you about 15 minutes to record your analyses okay uh, just, this is just for the journal so let's take a look all right folks so here is the clip uh, basically I'll just show it to you cold uh, take a look at what happens in this uh, video clip and write down your interpretation, write down your analysis of what you're seeing here. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, folks. So, uh, yeah, kind of weird there. Okay. Uh, so take some time here. Go ahead and get in your journals and write a little bit of what you just saw here. Okay. Uh, what's your interpretation of it? What's your analysis of it? Uh, what kind of things did you see going on? What kind of things do you think it means? Uh, but how did they portray some of these events in a way that was kind of unusual or maybe a little quirky, uh, maybe even a little horrifying? Okay. Uh, let's take a let you guys take 15 minutes here to complete this exercise. So, uh, hopefully you guys have had a chance to uh, write out your ideas about what was going on in that weird video, okay? Uh, some good analysis is always going to help you to understand a little bit better uh, what's really happening in a visual, okay? Now, let's talk about how you make a visual analysis interesting, okay? First off, one thing to remember is that there's always a persuasive element to analysis. You are trying to convince the audience <clears throat> that your analysis is the correct one for the circumstances, even when there is visual proof. It's especially true when there is visual proof. You're trying to tell them you need to believe what your eyes are seeing uh, and let me tell you what you're seeing. Let me tell you exactly what it is that this means. <clears throat> okay? 
In analyzing this film, you have attempted to exert your analysis on your, uh, on your audience to persuade them that your interpretation is correct or worthy of inclusion in the discussion at the very least. Okay. Uh, this was initially a team exercise, so that's why there's uh, references to teammates here. Okay. Uh, let's talk about this. A visual analysis of any media works in much the same way. You're presenting your interpretation, demanding a seat at the conversation. When you are doing a visual analysis, you're actually saying, hey, this is how I see the world. This is how I'm seeing what's going on in this visual. This is my interpretation. You may disagree with me. You may agree with me. Whatever happens, I am going to tell you what I'm, what I'm talking about here. I'm going to tell you my interpretation. I want to participate in this discussion. Okay. The key to keeping an audience's interest with analysis is challenging what they themselves find in the visual element. Even if you agree with their interpretation, there may be a different approach you're taking to reach the same destination. Okay? So maybe you're both seeing it the same way, but you're seeing it the same way for different reasons. Maybe you're reaching that conclusion from an entirely different avenue. Okay? So let's talk about how uh, people have used visual analysis in a, in a professional setting. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at some articles. Okay, uh, these are uh, called scenic routes. Okay, uh, one of the most prominent examples of visual analysis in professional writing is the defunct column "Scenic Routes" from the AV Club website. The AV Club is a very well-known uh, entertainment news site. Uh, does a lot of news, does a lot of reviews, uh, does a lot of uh, opinion pieces. Uh, many of it is in the vein, it used to do a segment called Inventory, which is in the, very much in the vein of like if you uh, go on YouTube and you find any Watch Mojo videos, they're kind of similar to that. Okay? Uh, but there was a series called Scenic Routes. In the series of columns, a film critic by the name of Mike D'Angelo analyzed individual scenes from popular movies as a means of presenting an interpretation of their meaning or simply to comment on their impact on the filmmaking craft in general. So he's actually doing a visual analysis and he's doing it based on these individual movie scenes. Uh, when he's presenting his analysis, it is going to be in terms of their significance to the plot or their significance to filmmaking in general or history in general. Okay. Uh, so we're going to have you guys taking a look at some of uh, Mike D'Angelo's work here. So I have chosen seven uh, articles from Scenic Routes to read and discuss. Uh, decide if you disagree or disagree with D'Angelo's assessment of the scene in your article and why. So it's going to really help if you have seen the movies that he's analyzing. Okay. Uh, if you haven't seen the movies, uh, you may want to search around through uh, the archives of the AV Club uh, for, for some other scenic routes for a movie that you may have seen. Okay? So, post uh, once you have uh, read D'Angelo's work and decided whether you agree with it, I want you to post your opinion to the questions professor thread for this exercise. Okay? Uh, tell, tell us what movie, he, what movie he was talking about, what the scene is, and whether you agree with his interpretation of that scene or not and why. Okay, whether you agree with that analysis or whether you disagree with that analysis and you think it should have been analyzed a different way. Okay, and what a nice thing, also the nice thing is, is that most of these, uh, art, most of these uh, articles are going to include a link to uh, most likely a YouTube clip of the scene that he's analyzing. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to have 15 minutes to read and discuss the article of your choice. Now, we have, I have seven that I've chosen, but again, if you have not seen these movies uh, or you can't find the scene that he's talking about, uh, either on uh, YouTube or any other source, uh, you may want to choose a different one of the Scenic Routes articles. He did write quite a few of them uh, before they completely canceled the column. <clears throat> okay. So the articles that I have to choose from, the movies in question, uh, Saturday Night Fever, The Matrix, Little Shop of Horrors, Wall-E, Joe vs. the Volcano, Kung Fu Hustle, and Gladiator. So just so you have an idea of what we're dealing with here, I'm going to click on Saturday Night Fever. Okay, so uh, our title of this one, Saturday Night Fever's most iconic scene demonstrates the power of editing. 
Okay, this is going to be one about film craft. And the scene in question is the uh, one scene that everybody knows from Saturday Night Fever, which is the, 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 the uh, most famous disco scene. Okay? So there's that. Uh, the Matrix. Quiet scene from The Matrix demonstrates how to make exposition compelling. So this is the meeting between uh, Neo and Morpheus that he's analyzing. Uh, this is the red pill versus blue pill choice. Okay. Uh, Little Shop of Horrors. Uh, Little Shop of Horrors demonstrates the fine art of setting the scene. Now, this is... Uh, ooh, this is the very first uh, clip from the film, the very first song. Uh which is called Skid Row, and it's used to set the scene of uh, where the movie takes place. Now, unfortunately, it looks like it does not have a film clip, but if you search around, uh, search for Little Shop of Horror Skid Row, uh, you probably will find the clip in question. Uh, next one, Wally. -E. Okay. <clears throat> Prize possessions say a lot about a person, even if that person is a robot. Okay. Uh, so the scene in question, uh, let's see, this is Wally taking Eve into his, into his home and showing him, showing her his collection of garbage. Okay. And next, Joe versus the Volcano. Now I will admit, uh, to you guys, this is actually a movie that I have not seen. Okay. Uh, but it's a uh, Tom Hanks movie from the late 80s, early 90s, okay? An all-time favorite scene finds fun in the most mundane of places. Let's take a look really quick. Um, so it's a scene where Tom Hanks' character is buying luggage, okay? Uh, if you're not... F uh, they give you a brief overview of the plot of the film Joe vs. Volcano. Uh, Tom Hanks is playing a terminally ill... Uh, a fella who uh, decides he's going to travel to a tiny Pacific island and throw himself into a sacrifice himself to a volcano uh, to appease the gods who rule the island's inhabitants. Okay, so uh, he actually gets a lot of money from a tycoon who convinces him that this is the thing that he should do. Now, if I remember right, the twist to this movie is that it turns out he's not dying. Uh, and he has to decide whether he still wants to, care, to go through with the plan or if he wants to live. Okay, uh, next one, Kung Fu Hustle. Okay. If one unintentional stabbing is funny, just wait till they get to the fourth. Uh, so this is a particularly slapstick scene from Kung Fu Hustle, which is an altogether slapstick movie. Uh, this is a film that is basically pretty much a parody of just about any uh, Hong Kong gangster movie, okay? Uh, and the scene in question is a scene where uh, the director's character, the director of this film is Stephen Chow, uh, he is trying to uh, uh, sneak up and assassinate the landlady of this uh, area of Beijing that, the gang that a gangster gang wants to get into. Uh, the thing is that she is a hyper-powerful uh, kung fu master uh, and is to the point of being cartoonish, okay? This is another one that they don't have a clip of it here, but it's something that you can find, okay? Let's see. And the last one is Gladiator, okay? So the scene the aliens, uh, Gladiator makes a rousing case for going big and obvious, so this is the first uh, col this is the first major Rome Colosseum uh, uh, scene from uh, the, the film Gladiator, uh, when he first confronts confronts Commodus, where Commodus is now the emperor. Okay. All right. So uh, that's the basis for this. Uh, again, if you haven't seen any of these films, uh, or you'd be more comfortable with a different film. Uh, go ahead and pick a different one from the uh, list of scenic routes. Uh, there's all, on all these articles, there is a view all list of view all link that will take you to a comprehensive list of every single uh, 
scenic routes column that D'Angelo did for the AV Club. Okay, so uh, let's give you guys about uh, 15 minutes. Uh, read your chosen article and then post a question to the professor uh, whether you agree with D'Angelo's interpretation of the scene or not. Now that you've uh, had a look at what others have done for visual analysis, now it's the time to take a look at what you're going to be doing for visual analysis. Okay, that's going to that's going to be this project. Okay, to fulfill the visual analysis requirement for the class, I'm going to have you guys create blogs in your teams. Okay, each team will be responsible for creating and formatting a blog for their topic. The topic you choose should be a topic steeped in current events and it will be visually based, presenting photographs and video clips for your analysis. Let me repeat that. It has to be visually based, okay? I, when I've done this, this version of the assignment before, uh, I have had several students who uh, didn't get it, okay? Uh, and they posted normal blog posts, which are fine and dandy any other time, but the problem is the focus of this is visual, okay? so any kind of interpretive analysis or anything like that of uh, news stories or anything like that as if you're not analyzing news photographs it's not going to work okay now in earlier years this assignment included a requirement to write a full text blog post however that requirement does not apply to the project this time around so what we're going to do with the uh, pretty much the duration of the uh, 
uh, lecture here. Uh, we're going to give you an overview of what your blogging experience should entail, including how to deal with the design issues and the legal question of fair use. Okay? So, and we will get into the requirements of what is needed uh, at a later time. All right, so why is blogging important? Blogging has become an invaluable resource for readers and writers alike. For the reader, blogs offer different perspectives on people, events, and topics of interest that may not have been obvious, mainly because blogs are typically written by normal individuals. Uh, Joe, Joe Blow off the street is writing in his blog. Several bloggers around the world offer varying perspectives on their own lives through their blogs. They tell you things like what goes on in their ordinary lives that might be different from what your own experience is. Uh, they try to talk about their every day. They talk about their friends. They talk about the environment around them. Okay. For the writer, a blog offers a quickly published means of expression which reaches an audience almost instantly. Okay. One thing about writers is we have a tendency to try to find the best way to get published. We want to get out to that audience as soon as we can. The nice thing about a blog is that you can do that immediately. They allow for off-center viewpoints to find a voice, and it also allows you to interact with your audience uh, and for your audience to interact with you, but we'll talk about that in a minute. All right, here's some blogging basics. The blog includes a number of basic elements, okay? First off is a title, okay? It's usually a creative title, something to set apart the blog from others or to establish the subject matter of the blog. It could be just as simple as topic of the blog, okay? Uh, it could be something that's more elaborate. It could be something like somebody's username. It could be anything like that. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, I have three blogs of my own uh, that I uh, run some more often than others, okay? Uh, my blogs have three particular titles, okay? Uh, excuse me, no, I only have two now. My bad. I forgot. I had a, I had a, a hacker issue a, few, a couple of years back and uh, had to delete my blogs. I had to delete my three blogs, but uh, I, had to, I brought uh, two of them back, okay? So one of my uh, blogs is called Mythic Popular Culture. Uh, for most part, I use that as a personal blog. It's where I uh, reblog stuff that I find is interesting. I do uh, some story-based stuff. Uh, I do some storytelling-based stuff. Uh, lately, I've been posting a lot of cat stuff, uh, mainly because that's how I keep my sanity. Okay. Uh, the other uh, blog that I run is called my is called my stash of incomplete nanos, uh, which is kind of like a place where I can leave uh, incomplete manuscripts. Uh, for uh, books that I want, that I wrote for Nano Nano Rimo, okay. Uh, I've got a number of manuscripts there, uh, including at least one, I believe, one winner, okay. I just haven't had a chance to do anything with it yet, so I'm getting it out there. Uh, just if in the on the off chance somebody decides to look at it, they can enjoy my writing, okay. So. Titles have to be creative. The voice has to be unique. The blogger has a unique style to their writing, which gives a good differentiation from other blogs on the same topic. Okay? One thing to keep in mind here is that blogs tend to be a non-academic format. Okay? So you are allowed to write the way you speak. That being said, blogs you write for me, I do want them to be mechanically accurate, but you can still uh, use a little bit looser language. Okay? Postings. Blog entries work in a similar fashion to journal entries in that your unvarnished thoughts are presented on a page. Okay? That's one of the big things here is that uh, blogs tend to be published without editing okay? uh, or any kind of oversight uh, unless it is like a corporate blog. Uh, for the most part, you're going to be posting stuff that comes straight from your brain right to the screen. Okay? Uh, then interaction. Users can usually submit feedback to a blogger right away. Oftentimes, as soon as they finish reading a posting. Uh, the blog platforms that we're going to use for this project uh, have that option. They, they will allow readers to give you feedback immediately. Okay? Uh, that's one of the unique things about blogs is that the authors can directly interact with their audiences.
And let's talk about blog types, okay? Uh, one type is a personal blog. The writer usually details elements of their personal lives that they feel their audience will find interesting, okay? Uh, especially if it's something that they experience that some people may need uh, a gui guidance on. This would be things like mommy blogs. Uh, this could be things like special needs blogs, okay? Uh, blogs made by special needs individuals. Okay, blogs made by uh, disabled individuals uh, are particularly good for this. Uh, blogs also for everyday uh, experiences of individuals that you may not necessarily share a group identity with. It's just so that you have further, let's say further viewpoints or different viewpoints to choose from. Okay, that's how a lot of the blogs that I follow work. I actually seek out differing viewpoints from people whose experiences are way different than my own. Okay, uh, news blogs, where the writer offers commentary on current events or news of the day, usually without filter. Okay, uh, news blogs can be t can be touchy because people will occasionally start injecting their own uh, interpretations into the news, which is not altogether bad. But it can be if it turns into something that uh, becomes, uh, let's say, aggressive in nature. Okay, uh, you tr want to try to be as level-headed as possible when you're de dealing with the news. Okay. Uh, we have the art blog, where the blogger posts artwork, either their own or their perspectives on others in various media, such as graphic art, photography, video, so on and so forth. Okay. A lot of artists are out there with blogs uh, and they will post stuff to the blogs to get feedback from their audience so that they know what they're doing right, what, what their audience is interested in, what they could possibly make money selling. Okay. And then you have the fandom or entertainment blog, which is usually on subjects related to single pop culture intellectual properties that can offer a variety of posting types to express their opinions about or affections for the topic. Okay. The, the fandom blogs are usually going to have a wide variety of stuff. They may post fan fiction. They may post link. If you're familiar with the uh, archive of our own, they may post links to that. Uh, they may post uh, fan art. They may post clips, gift clips, uh, gift sets, things like that. Okay, all sorts of things that fandom blogs usually cover. All right. So there's also a difference in the types of blogging platforms that you can find, okay? There's par primarily four different types of blogging. So you, first off, you have microblogging, which has short, concise posts, which are off the cuff and not a lot of thought behind them. Uh, the king of microblogging, honestly, is Twitter, okay? Uh, there used to be 140 characters uh, after 2017 and for forward, it uh, went up to 280 characters per blog. Uh, per post, rather, or I should say per tweet, okay? Uh, but uh, this is a this is pretty much the gold standard of microblogging, okay? Uh, you have photo blogging, pictures or short videos. Uh, this is somebody something that I know you guys are uh, into because I've seen people talking about this, okay, on the uh, teen discussion boards. So this would be Instagram, this would be Snapchat, uh, TikTok, okay? Uh, this is where you get photo blogging. Okay. Uh, then you have vlogging, uh, video blogging on multiple topics. Uh, could be pretty much anywhere that it acts as a video platform. Uh, the main one that you probably see vlogs on more often is going to be YouTube. Okay. Uh, I listed Twitch here because I kind of count Let's Plays as a vlog. Uh, but they're not like traditional blogging though but it is it is it is video content that is unique to the individual and it shows their personality so i kind of count it uh but more more often if you're going to do traditional vlogging that's typically going to be youtube uh and then you have traditional blogging which is medium or long text posts with a variety of post types text and video uh so main sites that we'd work with for uh traditional blogging would be sites such as Blogger, WordPress, or Tumblr. These are, got, these are the dedicated sites that do this type of blogging. I may also notice that I put Facebook under every single one of these categories because Facebook is trying to be a be-all, end-all clearinghouse for any kind of blogging. Uh, they're trying to be uh, basically a social media hydra, okay? Uh, while that's okay, I suppose, 
uh, the problem is is that they do they don't can't really focus on any single one of these so when you try to use their service for any of these functions anything other than typical social media functions it's not gonna go too well okay let's take a look at some samples of each type of blog okay so uh, first one here is a sample of a news blog uh, this in turn this particular blog is Mashable, uh, which is a well-known news site. Okay, it's a general news blog site. Uh, you may see some of the articles here. Seven coping skills to deal with anger you might be feeling right now. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, some of the, this was fairly recent because it's uh, sh uh, showing uh, Apple Dropkicks Fortnite out of App Store. Okay. Uh, so that, that just took place in August, okay? Uh, also the uh, news about the uh, TikTok ban, all right? Uh, all that fun stuff, okay? So Mashable is gonna uh, have a front page like this and then uh, links to the all the different articles in the blog. So here's an example of a personal blog. This, this uh, personal blog is called Mom Knows It All, okay? Uh, started, for the most part, it's typically a mommy blog, okay? However, she also does a lot of stuff with her cats, okay, as you can see here. Uh, this looks like she had a lot of updates about her cat when he was sick, okay? So, uh, Mom Does It All is more of long lines of personal site. She's talking about her everyday life. She's talking about what goes on in her home. And we have an uh, art blog. This is a blog called The Jealous Curator, okay? This is a modern art blog. Uh, this particular blogger actually takes uh, gets samples from collections that are pro that are currently on display at galleries. Uh, the jealous curator has their own gallery, okay, uh, and a lot of the stuff is stuff that's not being displayed at their gallery. Hence the reason why they call it the jealous curator, okay. So this is a, a good example of an art blog. And then here's an example of a fandom blog. This is actually a humor blog, humorous fandom blog called Did You Know Steven Universe? Uh, this particular one is uh, trying to do posts in the format of uh, Did You Know Factoid uh, infographics. Uh, but as you can see, uh, they are not taking it seriously at all. Okay? Uh, so that, so that's, the t that's the type of posting that they do. Uh, it's going to be a lot of stuff about uh, one individual uh, property so that they happen to be a big fan of, okay? All right, let's also talk about multimodal texts, okay? Uh, multimodal texts use more than just words to influence their audiences. They use things such as images, they use sounds, they use video, and they use page design, okay? Blogs are going to be multimodal in nature. Their, their design, the way that they're laid out, the images used, how those images are presented, those are going to all influence what your audience thinks. Their multimodal texts are more prevalent in the electronic era. That's not to say, though, that they haven't been around for centuries. Okay? They exist as far back as we know as medieval works, okay? which are so-called illuminated texts. Let me show you an example. All right, so here we have an example of an illuminated text, okay? Uh, so this is intended to enhance the reading experience by having all this art and filigree around it, okay? Uh, part of this is an inscription of, I think that's supposed to be Jesus. I uh, couldn't tell you for sure. Um, let me see what the, uh, uh, it doesn't really give anything, this is Armenian in uh, origin, uh, but you can see what we have around here, around this uh, image we have uh, around the text here, uh, it kind of looks like a uh, decorated building uh, with a number of birds around it, a number of trees, flowers, uh, we have some very intricate gilded artwork here uh, on these uh, pil pillars. Uh, which are being held up by the heads of what look like jaguars, okay, or some kind of uh, large cats. Uh, so this is what we're talking about with an illuminated text, 
Okay. Now, this is the way uh, they did multimodal texts in uh, medieval times. In modern day, we have more electronic media. Multimodal works use their multiple media to fully explore an argument and illustrate it for the reader, especially when certain elements of the topic are difficult to put into words effectively. That's the key here. If you have trouble articulating your topic, a visual might help with that. Now, let's talk about using words, images, and sounds rhetorically, okay? Media other than text can be used as a hook to get the audience interested in a posting, okay? Uh, this could include things like audio files, uh, either audio files that you use as mood music, but please try not to because that tends to be annoying, especially when people can't find how to turn it off, uh, or an audio file that's directly analyzed by the post, okay? Uh, you can do it with photos, which are which wind up being discussed in the posting, okay, uh, anal and analyzed uh, thoroughly as to what's going on in them. Or you can do it with video, which is also analyzed in the posting, okay. Uh, when you pre when you present uh, hyperlinks, occasionally it will also auto generate what's called nutshell text, which can sum up a hyperlink's contents to encourage a reader to visit the site, okay. Uh, it basically gives a brief one-line summary of what that article is about. It's sometimes as short as, as, as a sentence. It can include a personal reaction or analysis of the link. Uh, when you, if you decide to you, if you ever wind up using a hyperlink as a blog post. Now, again, just as a reminder for this particular assignment, the only thing that you should be using for your posts is visuals. Okay, visuals that you will have to write about. The post cannot rest on the header's laurels alone, though. Strong content will keep that reader and make them into a subscriber or follower coming back for more content. So you cannot just throw a picture up there and leave it at that. You have to present your interpretation. You have to present your analysis of what's going on. Uh, let's talk briefly about video narratives, okay? A uh, subgenre of blogging is vlogging, which is short for video blogging. Bloggers set up their cameras, many times just talk, talk into it, but occasionally they use it to make video essays. Now, there's a few things that vloggers have to concern themselves with, and I'm actually learning this the hard way because I'm having to deal with them myself. One is audio, that is soundtracks, dialogue levels, and associated audio with video clips. You have to make sure everything matches up, you have to make sure that the soundtracks are clear, to make sure the dialogue can be heard. Okay, uh, make sure that you have uh, music that you are allowed to use. Okay, uh, then you have video clips. Many sample other video media, media, which is legal under fair use doctrine. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Okay, then we have setting. The typical vlogger has some kind of neutral backdrop behind them. Okay, uh, the earlier vloggers use what I what I use. Okay, uh, they use bedrooms or offices, workshops, whatever as backdrops. Okay. Some still do, okay? uh, especially if you watch some professional bloggers, okay? some, some professional vlogs. Okay? Uh, one, one good example of this is Adam Savage. Okay? You may remember him from Mythbusters. He has a, uh, a vlog called uh, Adam, Sa Adam Savage is Tested. Uh, and Tested is always in a similar workshop or similar warehouse uh, to where they did uh, the studio shoots for Mythbusters, okay? So earlier vloggers had bedrooms and offices. More recent vloggers set up studio spaces uh, using things like roll down backdrops or neutral wall spaces. Uh, especially if you look at a lot of Let's Players, you will notice a lot of them use the same thing on their walls. It's typically acoustical foam. Uh, that way it, didn't, it deadens any echo in the room and allows you to focus on their voice. Okay. Then you have editing, which composing all the above elements into a logical progression, which expresses the vlogger's point. Editing does tend to be a challenge and it tends to be very time consuming. However, if you do it right, uh, it's going to feel seamless and it's going to feel like something that really makes sense. Let's talk about audience interactivity. The unique quality to blogging as opposed to standard writing is that feedback can be immediate. Okay, People can tell you what you're doing right or wrong right away. 
Most blogging sites supply commentary sections for audiences to talk back to the blogger. Okay, uh, That's really kind of a convenient thing for the audiences so that they can interact with their favorite bloggers. All right. Audiences' tastes will shift suddenly, occasionally at a hat drop. Okay, You will not see the same thing getting popular twice, usually. Uh, I present as evidence of this the typical lifespan of an internet meme it tends to be no longer than around a year before it's supplanted by the next popular meme. Okay, And believe me, I know there's a lot of memes out there that uh, I know of a lot of memes that are completely dead. Okay, But people do tend to try to resurrect them. Okay, So, uh, audiences online tend to be very critical when a writer's or a blog's tone changes. Okay, so you want to keep that voice consistent uh, because they want to be, they want to understand that you're, you're going to say the same no matter what. Okay, uh, so they can rely on you and they can trust you to uh, present the same thing for post after post after post. Okay, so let's talk. What causes these shifts? Uh, sometimes this is as simple as the audience shifts because if something goes viral uh, and all of a sudden now you have uh, something that wasn't intended for that audience and now it's getting to an audience that may not even really understand it or they find something humorous in it and then they start uh, memeing things and all of a sudden it goes all over the place. Uh, sometimes it's just uh, circumstances surrounding the blog change. Okay, So there's a lot of different reasons why your audience could shift. So let's talk briefly about uh, shifting audiences in terms of memes. All right, so here's what we're looking at here. Uh, these are a number of uh, internet memes, some of which are older than others, okay? Uh, some of them come back to the uh, origins of memes, okay? Uh, some of these, you probably know the joke behind them, okay? So first off, uh, this one is an all-time favorite uh, right here. This would be uh, Grumpy Cat. Uh, sadly, she passed away two years ago, uh, but she is still immensely popular. Uh, you still find a lot of Grumpy Cat stuff around. Uh, her memes are going to basically make her immortal. Okay. Uh, down in the bottom corner down here, this is Why You Know Guy. Uh, this is one of the numerous memes that originated from 4chan. Uh, this is a... Uh, uh, advice animal format meme where uh, it starts off by asking a certain asking a certain group a question and then the question is why you know something so for instance Facebook couples why you know use private chat okay uh, getting to more newer memes okay uh, here we have the distracted boyfriend meme this stems from a piece of uh, stock photography uh, and a lot of people will uh, attach uh, avatars to the uh, individuals in the photo. It's basically a man walking with his girlfriend getting distracted by another woman walking by. Okay, uh, As you can see, this version is uh, the guy is supposed to represent Cartoon Network uh, ignoring all their other shows in favor of Teen Titans Go. Alright, up here uh, this is the This Is Fine Dog meme uh, where he's sitting in a, in a room that's on fire uh, and totally ignoring it in favor of his coffee, saying this is fine. Okay. Uh, one thing of note is in 2017, uh, the cartoonist of this cartoon uh, actually posted a sequel to it, uh, saying no, it's not fine at all. And the dog starts running around desperately trying to put the fire out. Okay, and yelling, "What was I thinking?" Okay. Uh, the one below him, right here. Uh, I have no idea what the actual name of this is. I tend to call it Surprise John Cena. Uh, so uh, so basically it's a four panel comic and, and ends with the uh, uh, still from the entry video for John Cena from the WWE. Uh, many times these, most of the times these are uh, v video in nature. Although I have seen one posting where uh, there's a phone number that uh, women can give to creepy guys if they ask for her number, uh, and the number just blasts this uh, the John Cena entrance in his ear. Okay. Uh, next one, Big Chungus, uh, kind of a offbeat one. Uh, has didn't really have much of a shelf life to it. 
Uh, Big Chungus is basically a fat version of Bugs Bunny, uh, who gets his name from a video game comment from a video game blogger, uh, YouTube personality named Jim Sterling, who uses the name Big Chungus for any video game reviews he does, where it requires him to enter a name, a username. Okay. <clears throat> Kind of a weird guy, that guy. Okay. Uh, the next one is the me and intellectual meme. Okay. Uh, Switch is Nintendo's first portable console. Me and intellectual. Uh, remembering that the GameCube had a, had a carrying strap. Uh, this is kind of the uh, sarc sarcastic old guy type meme. Okay. Uh, next one became a meme based on a 20 year old Simpsons episode called 22 Short Films about Springfield. Uh, so this is the steamed hams uh, meme. You may remember uh, if you've seen the episode, you know, the context of this is Principal Skinner has the superintendent over for dinner, promised him steamed clams, but he burnt them. Uh, so he improvises and makes a bunch of sliders. Uh, and the superintendent says, I thought, Seymour, I thought we were having steamed clams. No, no, I said steamed hams. It's how we, it's what we call them in Albany. Really? Okay. So, uh, and then the one down here is one of the more recent uh, memes that I was able to find. Uh, this is a reference to the Area 51 raid from last year. Okay. Uh, so as you can see, you look familiar. Uh, if you're familiar with this, this is a clip, a clip from the end of Lilo and Stitch. Uh, it's the Grand Councilwoman and uh, Cobra Bubbles, who is a uh, uh, CPS worker, who is a former uh, CIA agent. Okay. Uh, so they, these two have met before in the past. They, they met in the seventies. Uh, but in this case, uh, she's saying, you look familiar. He says area 51, September, 2019. Ah, yes. You Naruto ran in front of the camera, uh, referencing a, a guy who literally Naruto ran in the background of a news report about the area 51 raid. Now we've had some fun traveling down memory lane. Let's take a further look at blogging. Mainly we're going to look at first at continue to look at shifting rhetorical context. Okay. So the main one is audience shift where a different group of readers, consumers or consumers find your blog. Uh, this can be sometimes happened by social media word of mouth. This is, this is the origins of going viral. Okay. Repost to Facebook shares on email, link shares on Twitter and other blogs. Then you have the posts that absolutely go viral and hit extremely wide audience through these channels. Okay. Uh, audience is two or three levels away from the original will probably react differently than the intended audience. Some people may actually be offended by it uh, because they're not the ones that it was made for. It was made for somebody else. Okay. Uh, and so that leads to an issue where, again, the shifting audience issue. Okay. Original audiences also tend to congeal in commentary sections, creating insider threats. Okay, uh, people who are in the know and have been there a long while uh, will sometimes create their own uh, uh, entertainment, so to speak. Uh, another possibility is writer shift. New administrator or blogger takes over the blog, or a blog is written by multiple contributors with differing viewpoints. Okay, uh, one of the best examples of this is wikis. Okay. Uh, wikis are collective reference sheets written by a collaborative effort. They are a true group effort, so they have no controlling lead author. Okay, that can sometimes lead to problems when there are disputes between authors. Okay, good example of this is uh, about five or six years ago when the GamerGate stuff was going on, and there was a Wikipedia listing on GamerGate whose text was changing on a daily basis until Wikipedia locked the site. Uh, based on which set of editors had control of the page on a given day, okay? Uh, so it could be it could vary toward having a tone that was very pro gamergate, or it could have a tone that was anti gamergate. Okay, it kept going back and forth. Reader response can also skew how a writer's effort is understood by subsequent audiences. Perspective comments can create wholesale changes in an author's credibility. This is especially true if they're writing about some sort of event. But then they get something wrong and a commenter who was actually at that event or knows of it or has intimate knowledge of it uh, calls them on their error. Okay. 
Then we have message shift. New message created by the commenters to the blog post, making an entirely new rhetorical point to the, for the original blog. Uh, this is a common practice on Tumblr. It's called blog. It's called uh, post hijacking. Okay, uh, where it'll start off talking about one thing, and then eventually, over the course of a number of reblogs, it starts talking about something entirely different. Okay, embedded hyperlinks cause a change in how writings are consumed. Okay, uh, if you are embedding hyperlinks to give more perspective, it actually it will actually help, and that it'll broaden the viewpoint of the post but at the same time it'll also it also may change the interpretation of it okay we also have tldr statements which you should probably avoid because they're typically summaries that's how you see it but that's not necessarily how other readers are going to see it and what you're actually going to do is poison the well so to speak and make them see it the way you see it okay commenters can also occasionally change the original blogger's point of view possibly make them disavow of the posting Okay, uh, especially if there's some major attitude shift that occurs with an author. Okay, if it's influenced by commenters, then they can take credit for causing a, a shift in the blog uh, to take credit for disavowing postings, that sort of thing. All right, let's talk about online safety issues such as privacy. Sharing is not a bad thing. However, in our modern age, there's such a thing as sharing too much. Just ask Lila Lewis. We uh, took a look at her resume where she decided not only to tell us about her uh, education and experience, but also give us her social security number, marital status, and her blood type. Okay? That's definitely oversharing. Okay? So never post any of the following to a blog posting. This is a matter of identity theft here. So things like physical addresses. Okay? Do not post your physical address to a blog. Okay? Never do that phone numbers okay unless it's like a corporate blog and they need a contact number for a webmaster you should never post your phone number in a blog and they have other identifying numbers such as id numbers social security numbers credit card numbers etc there are numerous cases of people who have suffered identity theft because they were young and naive and started saying hey look at what i got and they're showing off the driver's license without blurring the number or showing off their credit card without blurring the number they also cautious about what you post as content. Okay, you want to always follow the boss parent teacher rule. So that is to say, would you want your boss, your parents, or a teacher to read what you are about to post? Anything that comes back as a no is likely problematic. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, employers look at your blogs. Employers look at your social media. Uh, potential employers look at your social media. Uh, anything that's going to influence them to not hire you you do not want to post. Now that gets us to uh, protecting yourself legally. Okay. Now we're going to talk about intellectual property rights. Sharing pre-existing materials is subject to intellectual property law. So you should be aware of some terms here. Uh, first off, copyright law. Okay. These are protections of intellectual property and are guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution. Only the original producer of intellectual property is allowed to directly profit from it. Okay, that isn't to say that you can sh you can't shift uh, intellectual property rights to other individuals or other corporations, but uh, generally speaking, the creator is the owner. Fair use. Okay, copyrighted material. Uh, that is to say, and I should I should mention here that copyrighted material means. Uh, you hold the copyright as soon as you get it into a tangible format and that includes things like web postings and uh, web videos blog posts things like that okay copyright material may be presented secondhand with attribution for the purposes of the following which is considered protected free speech okay there's five conditions one is academic use uh things like teaching uh, educational class use okay uh that is how i operate for these videos that's how i'm able to uh give you clips from youtube that's how i'm able to do some of the stuff that i'm doing is because i'm using for academic use okay uh for criticism uh if you are doing a if you're doing a critical analysis of a work you need to be able to show samples of it okay so that counts as fair use Parody. If you're making fun of something uh, and you want to use clips from whatever it is you're making fun of, okay? Also fair use, okay? Uh, for commentary, 
If you're doing a general commentary about a subject that's related to the clip that you are wanting to use, uh, then again, fair use, you can use it. Uh, the last one is research. Uh, if you are using it to present a uh, result of research that you have done on a topic uh, that that clip uh, relates to, okay, then you can certainly use the clip. Okay, then you can certainly use the, me the media. Okay. One other thing you need to keep in mind is something called the Creative Commons. These are works made freely available by artists and writers for any purpose. If you want to use anything from Creative Commons, you simply have to search Creative Commons on Google. Okay, That's actually how I came about with the uh, music I use for these lectures is through the Creative Commons. Okay, Now, granted, there, are, there have been copyright trolls who have been trying to tell me that they, the music belongs to them. Uh, and I haven't really bothered with them because I'm not, I don't make money off these anyway. Why would I bother with it? Okay. So, uh, so we have fair use in action. Uh, I'm going to play you a clip that shows you a lot of, uh, copyrighted stuff and just almost all of it is covered under fair use. Okay. And as I go along here, I'm going to actually pick out what's being covered by what is and isn't covered by fair use, okay? All right, so as we go along here, I am going to uh, call out what is being used uh, that is covered under fair use uh, for this particular video. Here we go. <laughs> covered under fair use. Oh, what happened to you, Adam Sandler? You used to be such a lovable idiot. Now he's just an idiot. Well, it's because Adam Sandler doesn't follow the monomyth no more. Mono... what? The monomyth. It's also known as the hero's journey. It's why Happy Gilmore was a great movie, but Jack and Jill was... not. The hero's journey is a theory by a guy named Joseph Campbell. One of the ideas behind it is that all great stories include the same characters. There is no way that works for Adam Sandler movie. Yeah, it does. You can find all seven of these character types in Happy Gilmore. I don't get this. This is way too complicated. No, it's not. You know all these characters. There's a version of each of them in every great story you've ever seen or read. Every story has a hero. They're usually just yeah, your average coming. Joe in the beginning, because the audience has to relate to them. You're making this up. No, think about it. All great stories have heroes. They start small, with problems to overcome. And then they gain the wisdom and power to solve their conflicts. Sounds like you were talking about... Luke Skywalker. Yeah, exactly! He's a great example of the hero. We should act that out! The scene is covered. Look at me. Stuck on this crappy planet, and uncle got burned up like chicken cutlets. What are you gonna do? Me? Personally? I'm gonna save the galaxy and make out with my sister. The second archetype character is the Herald. And Kumar! What? No, the Herald changes the course of the story, <laughs> often starting the hero on their adventure. What, some weird guy says, stop what you're doing and go have an adventure? Sometimes, but it doesn't have to be a person. It could be an object, or an event. My life sucks. I don't fit in. Wish I could coming. leave and go to school. Whoa! Hey, Harry Potter, how you doing? I'm a talking picture like out of them Harry Potter stories. Listen, go to wizard school. They got a dinner buffet that you would not believe. Don't mind if I do. Okay, the mentor is awesome. It's a wise presence that guides the hero and gives him advice. Like Gandalf! Yeah, just like Gandalf from The Hobbit. Uh, but didn't Gandalf say, hey, Hobbit, go have adventure? This Doesn't that covered. make him the herald? Well, sometimes a character can play more than one role. Yeah, Mr. Gandalf, can't you do something about this deluge? It's raining, Don't dummy. You want to stop the rain? Why don't you get yourself another wizard? Are there any? Why? Are there wizards? Yeah, there's a couple, you know. I'm Gandalf the Grey. There's Red against the Brown. And you got Saruman the White. Is he a great wizard or is he? Yeah, between you and me, he's a real piece of shit. Threshold Guardians? They sound terrifying! Man, they're here to stop the hero from progressing on his journey until he proves his worth. Think of them as henchmen. Hey, Indiana Jones, we are Nazis. And we're here to stop you from doing what you gotta do. Nazis? Friggin' Nazis? You kidding me? Boom. Done.
I don't want you to stop being such pieces of crap. You find these guys everywhere. The trickster's role in the story is to create mischief. They provide comic relief, and sometimes they're sidekicks. I'm going to make sandwich. No brains. You saying I got no brains? And you want me to do a wacky dance for you? Hey, yo, not for nothing. You got any gold bomb powder? I am chafing over here. Oh, well, the shapeshifter, like the werewolf? Well, it's more about this a character changing their role in the story. A good guy can become a bad guy, a trickster can become a mentor, you know, that sort of thing. Can they change more than once? Sometimes they change a lot. Hey, what's up? I'm gonna stab you. Tell now nah, wait, I'll help you save your girlfriend. Now nah, wait, look at my funny hand wiggle. I'm so wacky right now. Now nah, wait, I'm gonna go into the moonlight and turn into a skeleton. Boom. The Shadow's the main enemy the hero has to defeat. He's the ultimate evil character. Everything the hero's learned, trained for, and overcome has led up to the Shadow's defeat. Yo, you stole my girlfriend, you learned wax on, wax off, you even stood up to my Cobra Kai boys. But I'm Johnny T over here, I'm gonna break your face right now. Johnny, that's great, but remember, you're the bad guy. You gotta lose. You gotta lose Ralph Macchio? What, are you kidding me? That is kind of the best. Does it always work? Well, the model myth is just a theory, but you'd be amazed at how often the hero's journey is correct. And it really works for Happy Gilmore? Oh, yeah. My name is all Happy Gilmore. My grandfather built this house with his bare hands. If you can't get the money together in 90 days, we're going to have to sell the house to someone else. All you got to do is just tap it in. Just tap it in. I don't date golfers. You know that bedroom at the top of the stairs? Yeah, that was my room. I think I'm turning that into my trophy room. <laughs> this guy's a real piece of sh <laughs> All right, so uh, you may have noticed that there was one, one point in that video that I did not say was covered under fair use. Uh, very good reason. The one piece of media that was not covered under fair use was stuff from The Wizard of Oz, uh, because The Wizard of Oz is now in public domain, which is what happens when your copyright runs out. Okay? Uh, so pretty much anybody can use Wizard of Oz stuff for now. All right, let's talk about ethical use of media. Uh, for for starters, if you're using, making your own original photographs, first off, you need is permission. You need to obtain permission for use of photographs, audio, and video recordings, or other media from those persons directly recorded by those media. Okay, so if you're creating your own original photographs or your own original video clips, and you're including other people in it uh, without any kind of alteration, you will need to get their permission uh, to include their likeness in those presentations okay another thing to do is compile a bibliography you should compile a complete bibliography of your sources for media usage primarily including links to the original sources this is especially true for sources such as deviant art which has had problems in years past of artists having work stolen from them uh, particularly by corporate in corporate entities that want to use it for pro for for-profit projects like clothing okay also, make sure you're conscious of IP law. Make sure that your usage does not cross any boundaries in regards to intellectual property usage. Most blogging is covered by fair use doctrine as long as the blog is nonprofit in nature. So basically, as soon as you sell ad space on your blog, you're negating your fair use. Your blog makes, your, makes you money through ad revenue. As soon as you start making a profit, uh, there goes fair use. Okay. Let's also talk about creating an ethical online persona. Your online persona and reputation is dependent on your actions and words in blogs and comments. So basically your tone, your voice, and the opinions that you present are going to create that persona. Internet anonymity tends to invite trolling, bullying, flame wars, so on and so forth. So try as much as possible to keep yourself above board, okay? Always go high, okay? Some things to avoid 
uh, when it comes to your ethical online persona. One is personal attacks or the, on those who disagree with you. Okay, do not turn it into a personal uh, shouting match. They're going to disagree with you. Everybody's going to have a different opinion. That's fine. They're allowed to do that. Okay. Use of stereotypes when discussing opponents. Do not uh, package your opponents into a certain group and say, oh, they do this all the time. No, no, no. That's not going to be effective in gr either growing an audience or dealing with these individuals who disagree with you. Okay. Also avoid lashing out at criticism. I will say uh, on a particular social media platform called Goodreads, which is typically for book readers and authors, there is a problem sometimes with authors who respond to bad uh, reviews left by users. Okay, They lash out when they get criticized. Uh, these are authors that are quick to lose their audience after this because nobody's going to want to read something from a person who's going to attack you if you disagree with them. Okay. So remember, not everyone who reads your post may be in your intended audience group, so be diplomatic about your language and your opinions, okay? If your post goes wider than what you intend, uh, there's a good chance that people outside your intended audience are going to be exposed to it. So you need to be understanding of what they need and what they're expecting, okay? Also, stick with a single online persona. Some bloggers have multiple personas under which they write, which can be hard to manage. Stick with a single identity. Stick with a single character. Uh, really, the character should be yourself. And that gets us to the team blogging assignment. Okay, so here's how this is going to work. Your team is going to be creating a single subject blog using one of three popular blogging platforms. Uh, it's either going to be WordPress, Blogger, or Tumblr. Now, under the blog assignment, uh, it's under visual analysis on eCampus. Uh, I have posted instructions uh, that are very easy to follow on how to set up blogs for each of those platforms. Okay? So, uh, that shouldn't be an issue here. The subject of the blog should be a current social issue that has high passions and strong opinions. Okay? Blog posts should be offering viewpoints and analysis on the social issue, including news stories, videos, opinion articles, or other media. Primarily, I want them visual. Okay, in fact, 100% visual, uh, photos and videos. Okay, uh, this is intended for visual analysis. You need to interpret what's going on in those visuals. Okay. You will set up every element of the blog's appearance. Be creative and make it appealing to an audience's eye. Okay. Uh, something that people are going to want to look at for extended periods while they read your blog. Here's what to include, which pages to include. You need to include a home page, which simply includes thumbnail views of the individual posts. Okay. Uh, you need to have an about page, which explains what the topic and the focus of the group within that topic is. You may also mention that it is a class assignment in this page as well. So you, every, every blog needs to have some kind of about page. Uh, many of these sites uh, just will have you do it as a uh, post to the blog, okay? And finally, you have the individual blog entries, okay? Here's how this is going to work for the teams. Each member of a team has to contribute at least two postings, okay? Each posting should be written at least 500 words and written as a visual analysis with an argument, okay? You need to have a visual attached with that commentary, okay? Uh, there's no point in doing a visual analysis if you don't have the visual. Ensure also that postings are fully proofread and edited by the team prior to their posting on the blog site. Okay, so you need to fully workshop these posts prior to posting them. Okay. One other thing, posts should be easily accessible to a general user of the blog site. That is to say, do not set posts to private. Okay. Uh, these are going to be publicly facing blogs. Uh, these are going to be blogs that anybody can access. Okay, so make sure that you are posting stuff that you would be willing to have other people other than just me see. Okay. The posts have to be in the form of an analysis of a visual media presentation. This would be artwork, photographs, or video files. The analysis itself should include your own personal interpretation of the meaning behind what's presented in the media. Okay. Again, visual analysis. You need to tell me what you think is going on and how you're interpreting it. If you need to perform research on the circumstances surrounding the depiction or any background on the original producer, 
be sure to include a citation of your research at the bottom of the posting. Uh, for the purposes of a blog, the citation just has to be like a link to wherever you found the information. Okay. You should turn in the following for each member of the team to the eCampus site in the form of a Word file. So you will need to copy paste the posts to Word uh, or to one of the acceptable formats in order to turn it in. So what you, what you will need to turn in, your file should include the blog URL, okay? And make sure that it's the actual URL because some of the Tumblr blogs last, last time this, we did this, they gave me URLs to their own dashboards. Uh, which does not work. You have to actually have a, a link that goes directly to the blog, not to a dashboard. Okay, and you can tell it's going to be a, da a dashboard because the URL will have the word dashboard in it. Okay, so blog URL, full text of blogs you personally wrote. Okay, it's only the posts you wrote. Okay, you will not receive credit if you turn in the entire contents of the blog to eCampus. I only want your posts that you wrote turned in on eCampus under your name. Okay? Make sure that your copies turned in also include the visual that you're analyzing copied into the document. Okay? If you're doing video clips, that might be harder. Just give me the YouTube link. Okay? Uh, but if it's still photos, still artwork, uh, something like that, then you need to copy paste it into your document. Okay. All right. So this blog uh, and everything, uh, everything related to it, all the retaliated materials is going to be due on October 30th at midnight. Okay. There's not going to be regular uh, workshopping sessions on this just because of the non-traditional uh, type of work it is. Uh, but I am expecting you guys to uh, take a look at each other's posts and give each other feedback and try to help them fix them up. Okay. Now remember, uh, every post needs to be at least 500 words uh, and attached to a visual. Also to help you with this, I've also included in the slideshow some examples of blogs you can take a look at to get some ideas for layouts. Okay. And I've picked one from each blog, uh, for one from each blog platform. So on the top here, we have UniWatch, which is a uh, blogger a blog, okay? Uh, it's a single topic blog, generally about sports uniform designs. It has a simple design, has a clean color scheme, and thematic elements to it. Uh, it also has a good organization to blog posts and stays mostly consistent. I'm just gonna give you a quick look at what you see when you click that link. So this is what UniWatch looks like, okay? Uh, and this is the design. This is the design that they chose. Uh, the next, the next blog, people of color in European art history. This is a Tumblr blog. Okay, it's a single topic blog about representations of persons of color in classical European art. Okay, so this is an art blog. Uh, it has subdued colors and very simple design. Okay, uh, we're not trying to do anything too flashy because that's going to detract from the artwork. Okay. And the posts are generally attached to images, including reblogs of posts from similar sites. Okay, uh, one that they've uh, blogged to, uh, linked to in the past is superheroes in color, uh, which is one about uh, uh, minority superhero characters. So let's take a look at medieval POC. All right, so this is the this is what you see when you go to people of color in European art history. Okay. All right, the third blog here is willwheaton.net, which is a WordPress blog. Now, this is a personal blog that's written by actor Will Wheaton, a uh, very, very well-known television actor, film actor. Uh, if you, as a kid, he was in Stand By Me. As a teenager, he was in Star Trek Next Generation. Uh, most recently, his television work included The Big Bang Theory. Uh, the design is eye-catching, but not gaudy, and it's simple to follow. The posts have wide-ranging topics from life in the entertainment industry to motivational content to recipes and political commentary. Okay, he's kind of all the way across the board here. Uh, some when I've accessed his blog most recently, it's been promoting his books. Okay, because he's also a writer. So let's take a look at WillWheaton.net. All right, so this is the front page of WillWheaton.net. As you can see, there's a lot of visual uh, attention grabbers here. Okay, but this is the uh, this is how his posts show up. Okay, so uh, that does it for this week. Uh, 
So in your groups, you're going to need to start getting together and uh, thinking over what your topics are going to be for this blog. Uh, again, it has to be something in uh, current uh, events, uh, something that's going to elicit a lot of discussion and something that you can find a lot of visuals for. Okay. One, one thing I want to make sure of though is do not try to do anything too esoteric about this. Uh, I will say that uh, two semesters ago I had one team that did a blog that was about athletic shoes. Okay. Doesn't really elicit a lot of discussion. Okay. So, uh, work on finding your blog topics. As usual, continue working on the discussion board and uh, MindTap. Uh, we'll do another Collaborate session on Wednesday. I will see you guys then. Uh, thanks for watching.